meeting of the House on February the 8th, 2022. We have just a couple of items to tend to today. Uh, first will be uh, approval of the minutes. Has everybody received their minutes on, in their email? From, the, from three meetings, January the 27th, February the 1st, and February the 3rd. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. So moved. Moved by Representative Dodson and somebody right, online. Second. Second. And that Cindy was? Neighbor. Second. Cindy Neighbor. Cindy Neighbor. Thank you. And that would be Representative Neighbor if seconded. Uh, if there's no further discussion, all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Shane. And those minutes are approved. We'll move straight into presentation from the Secretary of State's office on uh, Kansas election overview. And whoever uh, the Secretary has uh, also, we'll welcome them as well. So, uh, Mr. Secretary, it's, it's, you're on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, it's always good to see people chairing a committee I chaired for so long. So, and it's, your work is hard. Um, I served as chairman of this committee for four years and vice chair for two before that, and your work is hard. Um, I want to just kind of bring up the speed on a couple of things, kind of our legislative agenda and kind of where things are at. Um, a couple of things, you know, with the, the narratives of the national on elections kind of gives us an idea of some things in law that we would recommend. And we worked with legislative leadership to make sure we had some buy-in. Um, and and they, they were all agreeable to what we're saying, both the minority party and the majority party. We look at election security like cybersecurity. Um, you, you may be secure today on your systems, but that doesn't mean you are tomorrow. So we looked at things, one of the things that, you know, obviously with the Dominion argument, people were concerned that machines and tabulators were connected to the internet. Well, we, as we looked, it was never in statute. Now, to, for equipment to be passed through the EAC, touch screens cannot be connected to a network. But tabulators can. In Florida, actually, after um, the Bush v. Gore series, there was a lot of angst from the media saying we're not getting results quick enough. So they connected it to a network to communicate with the Secretary of State's office. We want to put it in statute not to do that. It's our position, and through most people we visit with, that they don't want them connected to the Internet or in a broad network. And so that way the media can wait. It is our feeling. I would rather provide accurate numbers than fast numbers. As a friend of mine once said, quoting Wyatt Earp, um, speed is good, but accuracy is vital. Um, and I want to make sure that we are actually accurate with numbers we give when we're doing election night tabulation. The other thing we want to make sure we're doing is our biggest, you know, to give you an idea, and we've said this for the last four years, how much this space has changed, is it used to be you were just the secretary for the state of Kansas, and now I'm the first secretary of state in the nation to have top secret clearance because we're now dealing with foreign nations that are trying to deal with our election systems. Our biggest concern is the poll book, not voting machines. That's really our hedge of protection that we want to establish as it relates to security. We've spent most of our HAVA money on defending the, our poll data, our poll book data, or our voter data list down to the county level. And I don't want to get into details because a lot of that is classified, but it's important that we protect access to the poll book from people who don't have a right to have access to it. Now you may be thinking, well, the poll book's a public record. Yes, but the social security numbers are not. Our concern, and a lot of foreign nations like North Korea and Iran would like to have access to that, one, to manipulate it, and two, to erase it. And also, they can take the data, your social security number, your voting history, marry it with other records on the internet, and try to create a digital you that can apply for a credit card and a loan and buy property and channel money through bank accounts. So by St protecting that poll book helps prevent them from creating that entire online profile of Kansas voters. Our concern, we had a, 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 a county election clerk actually access the poll book through a home open Wi-Fi system with no securities on the home side. And on my concern election night was we're going to wake up and the poll, the entire voter list was either going to be manipulated or erased was not. So we were glad, um, but that is our biggest protection. That's why we're spending our HAVA money in partnering with a security company that also the National Guard partners with 
to ensure that that is secure. But as it relates to poll books, what we found out in the last local election, and a lot of it's a training issue, but we don't have regulatory authority over the poll book like we do over machines. So one of the bills we're introducing is to make sure we have regulation over that poll book because we want to make sure that it's not discoverable on your cell phone because that has to be connected to a network according to the Help America Vote Act because you don't want to vote in one place and then suddenly go to another polling place and vote again, especially in early advanced voting. So what we want to be able to do is say that's not discoverable and put certain security measures because if you can find it, there will be somebody smart enough to hack it. And if you can hack Equifax, you can hack Cherokee County. So we want to make sure we're constantly putting in security measures to protect the, the integrity of our elections. It's like I say, you know, election security is like data security. There are people who will try to compromise the integrity of an election, and we have to just make sure we have the tools to stop it. I still stand by our clerk's work and all our volunteers, what they've done. They've done incredible work. They work incredibly hard. And, but that being said, maybe not next year, maybe not this year. It's a big election this year with Congress up and potentially being contested as it relates to the power of both chambers of Congress. We want to make sure as it relates to the Kansas election, we still continue to have the confidence in that. Something else we're looking at, and there was some criticism coming out early when we announced we wanted to do it, but they, we didn't have the language, so the criticism was premature. It was Currently, there's four reasons why you can remove somebody from the, the voter list. They died, they unregister or move, um, they uh, committed a felony. But one of the ones, we want to add a fifth one that says, if you haven't voted or done a voting activity, in, in a cycle that will trigger a, the county then has to send, was it two cycles, correct, because the NVRA? Two cycles, four years. Um, so that would send a notice. If that notice comes back not at this address or it, or it just doesn't come back, that would start a clock for another four years that after another four years, if there's no voting activity, they could be removed. The goal is not to remove voters from the list. The goal is to have accurate data on the list. And if you're not at that address, the county, in some apartments like in Wichita, here in Shawnee County, Johnson, Wyandotte County, your bigger counties, they're sometimes sending 30 notices to one apartment because there are people there and we have no right, legal right to just remove names off the poll book. But this is one that we can legally do if they're no longer at that residence. Now, we also want to define what is a voting activity. It's not just voting. If they applied for an advanced mail ballot but didn't send it, at least we know they're at that address. Let's leave it, because you're, you're not forced by law to vote. So if you don't want to vote, that's your right. I mean, I, I think you should, but if you don't want to, it, there's, you're not creating a legal activity. So what we want to do is make sure you are actually in that residence that you're registering to vote from. And if you're not, then after two cycles, because we understand some people just vote in presidential elections. If you're not voting or doing a voting activity, then you would come off that roll. So that's kind of our legislative agenda. Um, another thing we're looking at is um, enhancing our post-election audits. Since being elected in 2018, 2019, we did our first post-election audit. We have done over 300 post-election audits and not one county has failed. And that's really a credit to all the poll workers that volunteer and train anywhere from 16, I've got some poll workers that are 80, and they come out and they work and they weren't scared of a pandemic and they pulled, and, and I also like to look at Senator Virgil Peck's race, that was a complete hand count and it zeroed out perfectly. Um, but what we want to do where people do get concerned is in the close races. So what we want to be able to do is if there's a race that is within 1%, you would do another post-election audit before the, before the vote becomes certified and it would be 10% of the precincts just for that race would then be a post-election audit for that race, and it can't be the precinct that they already audited. So. Mr. Secretary, would that be for any level of race or just statewide races and state races? Any level of race, whether it's a school board, legislature, or congressional. Or city council. Or city council, yeah. Because it's the close races that people become concerned on. You know, if you're winning by 44% and the other person only put $500 into the campaign, people aren't really concerned that something nefarious happened there. But when it's close, you want more eyes on it. So that's our legislative agenda, what we're pushing. The other thing we want to do is we do um, 
accuracy and logic, lo logic and accuracy tests before the election on our voting equipment across all counties. And then you do it after the election as well. You can't do it during the election because they don't want people messing with the equipment once it's been programmed for an election. What we want to make sure is actually put deadlines in there so that that second logic and accuracy, accuracy testing is done before they certify the vote. That way, if it doesn't zero out and there is an issue and a candidate has been harmed, they now have evidence that can go and contest the election after it's been certified. So we're not doing anything really outside the box, but it is some, updating, some updates we want to do, provide in statute. And with that, I will stand for any questions you have. But again, we're, we're not trying, we've been consistent for the last four years to say we don't want drastic changes because we, want, we don't want to confuse voters. We don't want them to say, well, this isn't the way I voted before. We want the way they interact in voting be the same the way it has been for years. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'll answer questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Secretary, for being here with us. Uh, I don't know, I'm sure you know, actually, because one of your staffers was hit the, um, at the election integrity um, hearing last week mm -hmm. in the Senate, and it was very disturbing actually and so I have a few questions for you if you don't mind me in, uh, indulging me a bit um, and actually I put this out to some of my constituents who are concerned about election integrity because I get a lot of emails uh, about this and and when I'm out doing legislative coffees people ask me about it people do think there was fraud and uh, so here's some of the questions that I've I've received um, <clears throat> One of it, one of the first one is, why are we removing so many people that voted from our voter rolls? These are not active, inactive, or dead. They actually did vote. If they claim they moved away, then there's a mass exodus from our state. So I'm just curious to know, have we seen a bunch of folks that have been removed from our voter rolls from the 2020 election? I mean, is there... Well, so there are a lot of reasons that people would be vote because for inactivity. And so there's a there's a day. What is it after the election that we have that drop down? Right? It's March or April they, because they've been inactive or they've unregistered. And at that time, they would come down. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people will unregister to vote if they move away. A lot of college kids will do that. It's not necessarily if whether or not it's a mass exodus, you got to you got to marry the data. Voter registration is not a re necessary reflection of population. Mm -hmm. So a lot of folks who use that number is basing on census data. Mm -hmm. Well, that's including minors and non-U.S. citizens. That is completely separate than the voter rolls, which are U.S. citizens and of the age of 18. So if, when you have people unregister, sometimes they re-register because I voted, but then I got married and my, my name changed. Mm -hmm. And so that looks like they came off, but they actually changed their name. So is that part of, and I, I know just enough about this to be a little bit dangerous, is that part of the, the Elvis system? Thing? No. No. Uh, the, the Elvis system is our data that we host that populates the poll book. Mm -hmm. And after Help America Vote Act, it, part of the compromise that Congress had when they passed HAVA was the poll book must be in real time. Mm -hmm. So that if you're registered to vote in Shawnee County and you move to Sedgwick, the moment you register in Sedgwick, you come off in Shawnee. Okay. And so to do that, you had to have a centralized system. Prior to that, there was no centralized system. Mm -hmm. Every county had their own. So you mentioned about hosting, about you know us hosting that. Who who does host that? Like we we partner with a company called ESNS, and it's in a secure location. And I, it's a lot, a lot of that's classified. I can't show because once we start telling where our data is, people know how to manipulate it. But we partnered with the ESNS. They wrote a proprietary program for our office and for our state. But you don't think then that was hacked into at all? Oh, no, no. It wouldn't have been. I would have been in the Fusion Center within moments if that had been hacked. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you. Someone else. Uh, Representative Proctor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary, for being here today. Um, so there's a bill bouncing around this building uh, to ban uh, drop boxes. Um, it, first of all, do you have an opinion on that? But second, if we don't pass that, do you think there are any other measures that we should implement? I, I appreciate the question. I, I don't understand the angst with drop boxes. If I owed you $1,000, do you want me to put that cash and mail it to you? Or would you rather me drop it off? The Postmaster General sent every Secretary of State a letter certified and priority mail last in 2020. I still haven't got it. 
He swears he sent it. He's got the receipt. I never got it. We were getting ballots as late as March 2021 that were legally mailed prior to the election in 2020. I, when you're mailing a ballot, you're giving it to someone who is not a poll worker. And if you're on the eastern side of the state, it goes to Kansas City. It leaves the state and then is brought back into the state. If you're in the western side, it goes all the way to Denver. Or you can just drop it off the county office in their box. We would like some measures to regulate the security of it so it's consistent, because the last thing I need is a county getting sued because their security is not like this county security. If we can put a baseline of security, that would be helpful. But I don't understand why you would want to put it, and forgive me, Democrats, it's a Democrat postal union is what I would say. That's just my opinion. But I know. Um, but I don't know why you'd give it to the post office when you can just drop it off, and then there's a Democrat and a Republican in the chain of custody handling that ballot as to a, a postal worker who's treating it like a Bed Bath & Beyond coupon. I mean, I would rather it just go in the lockbox and then at 7 o'clock you empty it out, you have two poll workers that have taken an oath in training, and you lock it. I, I just think that's the appropriate measure. But we would like to set standards so every county's handling it the same. But drop boxes are, are nothing new. Um, the court system has been using drop boxes for years, and now the motor vehicles are using it. I, I love it because I didn't have to wait three hours to get my car tagged. I was able to just drop it in a box with a check. And so it's nothing new, but you know, if you want security measures, because anything to have people in confidence of that. But I'd rather do that than put it in the mailbox in front of my house. Too many people play mailbox baseball in my neighborhood. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Representative Topiker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Secretary, for being here. Uh, on the drop box issue, real quick. Uh, we passed some legislation that you're aware of last year that regulated uh, the uh, ballot harvesting. Mm -hmm. And I believe it was collecting more than 10. I think we, is it five? I th okay. The original version was five. It was five, and then we bumped it up 10. Um, and so if these drop boxes are in remote locations, even if they close at five and are locked up, uh, who is there to man the box in remote locations to ensure that only 10 were dropped off by one person? Yeah, if, if someone were to break that law, first off, I don't think they're putting it in a drop box. They're going to put it in a post office box because there's no camera on the post office box. Um, right. Or they're going to go to the grocery store and put it in the mail slot at your local hy -Vee. Um, the drop box, Mr. Is Mr. Secretary, could, could you speak just a little, little bit louder? Oh, sorry. It's just me. I don't like to hear myself talk that much. No. Um, so most people that were do ballot harvesting wouldn't use a drop box. They're going to use a mailbox because okay. it's going to be less secure. There's going to be less cameras. But what this goes back to the previous question is, but if we could have the cameras and set the most, all our counties already put cameras on there because they want to catch a crime if there is one. Um, but we, if we could put that in the statute that we have the authority to set that baseline. But when they're locked, you can't put a ballot in it. But we've heard stories and testimony that the cameras are blurry and fuzzy and uh, columns are in between right. the person dropping them off and, and, the, and that they can't be seen. And even if they can be seen, that nobody's looking at the video later. And then even if you wanted to look at the video, no one knows who has custody of it. And, and once you find out who has custody, then you cannot uh, get under even open records. You can't get that video to look at. Yeah, is that that true is, or not? That's all county issue. We have no authority. Again, we have no statutory authority over that. If you want to give it to us, we can establish that and put that and we can put that in rule and reg pretty quick. OK, um, most counties do have cameras and it's the same security cameras like in Lyon County. It's right there by the courthouse, which they have tons of quality cameras because you have a lot of criminals doing their 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 um, court appearances there or accused criminals doing their court appearance. Other counties, depending on resources, is the quality. But if we have the authority, we can establish that. Okay. And right now, all video is owned by the We own no video. Okay. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I was thinking that you already had it, but we can do legislation that... Yeah, it would, it would require legislation. Okay. And then I had a couple more, Mr. Chairman. Uh, on the, We are talking about poll books earlier, and uh, I think the bill that was dropped in 
uh, says that it would be on the, I'm paraphrasing, it would be on the election judge, the precinct judge, to ensure that the poll books and other equipment were not connected to the internet. And, and, how, and how would they do, how would they have the knowledge or the expertise? What if it was wireless or something connected to the internet? Well, first off, know? the poll book has to be connected to a network. That prevents double voting. Because if you vote here, your name shows over here you voted. Um, especially in early advance voted. And that's by federal law. They have to be connected to a network. We just want it non-discoverable so that people can't hack it. Voting machines so, are... Can, can I just stop right there and, yeah. and try to get... A, I'm trying to understand. So you said you didn't want connections to the internet, but now you're saying that the EAC says that they have to be, that the poll books have no, to be okay. connected? This, this, let, okay. uh, let me reiterate. Poll books and voting machines are two different things. Right. Think about when you go to vote. The first thing you do is you give your driver's license, like in your county, and they scan it, and then you sign the poll book. And you have to have your name, address. And an ID. Phone number. You don't need your phone number. Name, address, social security. Voter ID. That's it. No social security. No. You only need that to register to vote. Okay. So then you, you, once you, they get your voter ID and you sign this. Sorry about that. Once you get the voter ID and a person with a card escorts you to a machine because that poll book cannot talk to the machine. They put the card in there, and that's your ballot. That's what programs the screen, the touch screen, what your ballot is, which is specific for your precinct. Once you vote, it prints off a sheet of paper. You take that sheet of paper, which is actual ballot that gets tabulated, and you put it in the tabulator, because that machine cannot talk to the tabulator. The poll book is the only thing on a network. Okay. The only thing that we want to put in statute that can't be on the network is the touch screen and the tabulator. And, and sorry that I interrupted you when you were answering that earlier, but I was just wanting to follow up on that. So then uh, how would the judge uh, know how to ensure that a wireless connection wasn't there for a machine or a tabulator? We've had this circular argument for a while. First off, it would be discoverable. Now, we want to encrypt it on the poll book so it's not, but on the machine, you can, you can get scanners that say, oh, it's got a signal, but then do you trust the scanner? So now you got a scanner for the scanner, and eventually it becomes circular because it's a never-ending argument. But if it's not pinging today, if it's not sending a beacon, it can't turn on because it would need to have a connection to turn on. Think of it like this. I can go onto my computer and find my iPhone, but if I turn my iPhone off, I can't find it, and I can't turn it on because it's no longer on a network. So if they were on a network, they're not on a network now. They can't get back on the network unless a volunteer physically opened a machine and found a switch and turned it on, just like on your phone. Once you turn your phone off, it's off the network. You cannot remotely turn it on because it's not connected to anything. We have one online uh, question. Yes, this is Representative Neighbor, and uh, thank you for being here today, um, Secretary Schwab. Uh, the uh, question I have is when you were talking that you had done the audit uh, and that everything came out clean, and you're just asking for those close votes to be audited, who picks up the cost for that? Right, right now, it, 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 it'd be the county, just like almost all election activities are funded on the local level. And I want to be clear, I believe in that. Um, I've disagreed with a lot of my counties across the country that are asking for more federal dollars. We don't need more federal dollars. I don't want federal, tell, federal government telling me how to do an election. Therefore, I shouldn't have the right to ask them for money either. It would be on the county, but it's a nominal cost. And we visited with the county clerks on this, what it would be. First off, they would have to have a race within 1%. And then it's basically hiring three people from the community to help them do that post audit. And just real quick, so you know how these post audits happen, is you know, on election night, clerks are up till 4 o'clock tabulating the election. The next day, we are picking a random race, and then they pick a precinct to do a, a post audit election. What they do is they get 
they get that precinct, they get the ballots from that precinct according to the tabulator, they pull three people from the community that did not work the election, they can't got to be of at least two separate parties, and they hand count the ballots. And that's not like one, two, like you're splitting the red deck and the blue deck of cards. It is they pull out a ballot, and it's like the 1950s. They all agree what that ballot says. Do we all agree? Yes. There's one. Let's pull out another ballot. If that audit fails, they got to do another precinct. If that fails, they got to do the entire county, and that's just never happened because our poll workers and our clerks are so good. What would happen here is they would just do that for a few more precincts. In a lot of your more rural counties, 10% of the precincts might be two because they just have fewer precincts in your rural areas. Your bigger counties like Johnson, Wyandotte, um, Shawnee, and Sedgwick, they would have more precincts depending on the race, but they also have the resources to cover it because they have the population and the, in, in the budget to cover. I hope that answers your question. That does. Thank you very much. Should I look this way or this way? <laughs> Just up. You're right there. <laughs> Representative Collins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just wanting to go back to uh, what you were uh, talking about with the mail-in ballots and uh, kind of add a little bit to that. I, uh, <clears throat> I've had people ask me uh, during my uh, campaigns uh, what I felt about mail-in ballots. I said, well, I'm really not a big fan of them, but if you're going to vote by mail, uh, be sure and get your ballot in early. But it, even at that, like I said, it, it's still not... Uh, not 100% reliable, but just want to make that comment. Thank you. Yeah, to follow up with that, we, um, Connie Schmidt was our temporary clerk in Johnson County because um, we had a, a clerk resign. It's a presidential year. She came in. She had been the county election clerk for years, retired, and she'll tell you one thing she's not good at doing is retiring, so she wanted to help us and train the new clerk. Um, and her explanation of mail ballots are it's more process, it's more people, it's more provisionals, it's more problems, you know, and she had all these P's. But we need them because, like, I got a friend of mine who I love dearly. He's had a stroke. He doesn't have a van. His, the only way he can vote is mail his ballot. Now, he has the capacity to vote, but he just doesn't have the mobility to vote. So there are circumstances where mailing is your option. But if it's not, we recommend finding another way. You can turn, take that advanced mail ballot and turn it into any polling place on election day because it's already done. What's nice, what, what I want to make sure folks know, we've been really big as we've gone across the state. We've already done our Western Kansas tour, and obviously we'll be doing another one. But your ballot is your responsibility. It's not government. It's your ballot. Treat it like cash. Don't, if you wouldn't throw cash in the mailbox, don't throw your ballot in there, unless you have, that's your only option. If you have other avenues, your ballot, to make sure your ballot gets counted, is your responsibility. And it's the voter's responsibility. And it's my responsibility. And I will always say, in-person voting is the absolute most secure way to cast a ballot. But it's not always possible for everybody. Representative Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Secretary, how much cash would you recommend selling your ballot for? <laughs> um, not helping. <laughs> um, I want to thank you, by the way. Um, you've been keeping me informed of your campaign. Um, you'll be getting a check for me. I just haven't decided on the amount. Uh, but one of, your, no, just one of your emails indicated when asked by Democrats to remove polling places in the 2020 election, Secretary Schwab stood up for you. Mm -hmm. Where was that at? Um, there was the, the Democrat Party and some folks in the administration and some of our Democrat clerks wanted to cancel in-person voting for the election. My previous opponent in the general election was texting me asking me to cancel in-person voting during the 2020 election. He said, you're not going to get the poll workers and our poll workers are an aging population. Well, um, which is true. We, at the time we did, but we did a big marketing push on poll workers and just really worked the high school and the college kids to work the, the election, which was fantastic because you have a senior citizen in some of our bigger counties using electronics that you have now an 18 year old who's raised in the digital age working with that senior citizen to pull off a great civic activity and voting. We recruited so many poll workers that in Douglas County, they turned away over 400 applicants because they didn't need them. 
It's never happened in the history of the state. So that was no reason to cancel in-person voting because of poll workers. They just There was an, a, an agenda to try to move the state to mail ballot only elections like Washington and Oregon. And Kansans, over 60% of Kansans voted in person in a pandemic because they like to go vote. It's a civic celebration for them and they want their sticker. You know, and so that's where that was coming from. Hey, I like it. Um, thank you for that. Would you take a look at HB 2565? I, I made the mistake of asking the Federal and State Affairs Committee to introduce that bill because we were not meeting at the time. And I, unfortunately, they sent that bill to Fed and State. Okay. So it's not in our committee as I think it should be, but it's a it's a fairly simple bill. Would you take a look at that and see if you have any issues? We can if we want to have you over to the office or we can come to your office and discuss it. Um, I'm not familiar right off the hand. I'm no, sure no, I'm not nice. asking you to do that now. It's, yeah, it's, we'll take a look it's, at it. It's a, I always, it's a one paragraph change. It well, it requires county election officers to provide precinct level election results electronically in machine readable format which I don't have a problem in my county, but this was brought to my attention in another large county where they basically are being provided. If you ask for precinct information, you can't do anything with it. Yeah, there was a, and I always get, I've served with you long, long enough, we both know when somebody says this is a simple little bill, <laughs> it's a, sometimes a warning. Well, that's, why, that's why I'm asking you to look at yeah, it. Yeah, we'll take a look because at I don't it. Know I, enough, I don't know enough about it to know whether there are issues, but if there are issues that it raises, I would like to know that. I was it. asked to introduce it, I did. And if you have a problem, I want to know what that is. It, it, from the surface, I don't. But let us read into it and also have a, a conversation with our county clerks to see what they're doing. So one thing I also would like to add is, and I forgot to mention this in our opening remarks, we are contracting with someone who is or nationally known county clerk who actually was from Johnson County for years. And Representative Bajorn, you know, County Schmidt. She is r writing basically the training curriculum for election workers across the state. So they will all receive the same training across the board. And um, she uh, it was recently well, she's, she wants something to do. She says if there's one thing she's not good at, it's retiring. And she is a wealth of election knowledge. She has been a professional witness in federal court. Um, she's going to be helping train folks because between um, the aging clerk population, some drama, and also COVID, we had a lot of county cl election clerks that they're just done. And so we have a lot of new crop of election clerks, and we want to make sure we get them trained up and ready for this upcoming election. So I'm excited to say that we'll be working with her. That is still in the works, but we will be traveling the state. She'll be traveling the state training clerks and also going over their security protocols just in case they're not seeing something like, hey, you can secure these machines or you can secure this better and whatnot. So it's we're pretty excited that she's going to help us because she's a wealth of knowledge. She and, is the expert and, of the experts. And on a similar note, Mr. Chairman, um, House Bill 2570 got introduced by Fed and State, and consequently, because it said introduced by Fed and State, it got sent there for a hearing that is scheduled this Friday. I thought committee, this committee members would be interested, as I know you would, because it's on your list. Uh, it relates to audits. Yeah, that's the enhanced post-election audit will, bill. Will you be at that hearing? I believe I'm testifying on that Friday. If not, Clay will be. One of our, either I will be or Clay will be. He's no substitute for you, so <laughs> you can make it. He's got a better haircut. Um, I, I'm lucky enough. I'm I'm lucky enough to be on that committee. I think Representative Howell, as I look around the table, is the only one of us that's on Fed and State, but it's certainly election related, and I think it's critical to your. Uh, yeah, it's one of the things we were, were hoping to pass. So. And I, I'll save my questions till Friday. Friday for that. Awesome. Thank you, sir. And lastly, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Well, sure. You mentioned prominently in your uh, handout today the idea of election integrity, which I hope all of us are concerned about election integrity. On December 9th of 2020, I wrote to my local district attorney regarding illegal voting. You may recall in August of 2020, a criminal action was brought against our sitting congressman for using a UPS 
store as his, quote, residence. Out of curiosity, I checked the registration rolls and found that there were like 17 people registered at that same UPS store. Mm -hmm. In November of 2020, the general election, it appears that three of those people voted using that as their residential address. I didn't know it at the time until I was looking up the address of that store that there's a second UPS store in the city of Topeka. And again, I don't know these for facts, but it appears that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven people using that as their residential address voted in the November election. In addition to that, there is a local veterinarian who I know for a fact lives outside the city of Topeka, but he's registered to vote at his office here in the city. Uh, there's a used car dealer on Kansas Avenue that has a tiny little office at his used car dealership and uses that address as his residence. I asked on December 9th for our district attorney to investigate that and do what was necessary if things were necessary. I got no response in the three months that I asked him to respond. I wrote again on March 10th of 2021, reminding him of my letter and I got no response. Uh, the local reporters followed up on my correspondence and I read in the paper that the matter had been referred to our local sheriff for investigation. That was, I think, in April or thereabouts of 2021. And I've not heard any outcome of that investigation. For those of us concerned about election integrity, what else can we do for the prosecution of people who may have committed election crimes other than to report it to you or the district attorney. I asked the attorney general uh, during a committee meeting a while back if the district attorney, local county or district attorney, investigated something and took no action, would he follow up? And he said, no, he wouldn't. So, and I know you've had, you've had a request to get out of the business of actually doing something about voter fraud. Uh, whatever, you can comment when my question is completed. Uh, and I don't, I don't mean to put words in your mouth and you're here to defend yourself, so I welcome that if you, if you need to. But, and, and Mr. Chairman, I'm gonna pass these letters out uh, just to show, and I want the secretary to take a copy of each of those it, it, is it because all the people on that list are Republicans that's nothing being done, that there's nothing being done or nothing? I, I would just like to have some response that says we've looked into it, we found no evidence of fraud or, or whatever, but if people are violating the law, the election law, that is what causes citizens to have concern about the integrity of elections. Now, would you like to comment on that? Well, I'd, I'd like to comment on the one thing. I didn't want to get rid of tools to stop fraud. I just don't want prosecutorial authority because I'm not a prosecutor and I don't have a prosecutor in the office. And I would also have to have a law enforcement official in the office. And those are two FTEs I don't want to take on. And really, it's hard for us to be the judge and the witness. In a lot of these cases, we have to provide witness testimony. So I don't want to be a prosecutor as well. Um, in the law that we tried to do was allowing dual prosecution of those because right now, and I can't remember the court case, but if a DA or a county attorney takes the case, the attorney general can't unless requested to by the DA or the county attorney. The bill we were proposing would allow dual. So if the DA or the county attorney refused to investigate or prosecute, the attorney general could still come over the top and do it anyway. Right now, it's not in the statute to do that. Um, as it relates to this, I mean, we could we can Would you call and see if we get more information than you did. I have no problem doing that. I, I, I'm assuming you haven't sent us this letter. No, I didn't because I was, as I sit here, I'm quite shocked that I that I haven't heard anything from my district attorney. I had faith, given that he chose to prosecute a congressman, 
I, I understand the, what you're saying, Frank. You know, yeah. For exactly what appears to be exactly the same activity and said it wasn't political uh, when he did it on the eve of a primary election. He said it wasn't political that he waited eight months to bring charges against that congressman. Uh, then I figured it would be no... I, I don't understand why it would take uh, a year and a half now to investigate whether somebody lives at the UPS store. I... I I can't argue your argument at all. Um, Would you follow up for me, please? So I, I, I think I can follow up. I think as a chief election official, we owe it to the public to have an answer to, the, to this situation. Right, and this is when I just now got the question, so we can work on providing you an answer. And I do need to get. And it, you're an attorney, you know this. It all depends on the facts of the case. So I get us, that. Let us, and, and, and I'm not saying these people are guilty. I'm just simply right. So let us. Uh, this is what I have within my possession, and, and until I get an answer to the question. You know what? There are reasons, legitimate reasons, for people to be quote registered there and have a legal residence. But but I haven't gotten any explanation. Yeah, let me let me help you with that. And some examples of that is you, for example, you have a retired um, a retiree that lives in a trailer park and they just travel the nation. They live in Topeka during the summer months and they have a RV that they live in and they register to vote at the PO box. That's completely legal. The question is, is that the case here? I don't know. We'll have to get the facts, but I'd be happy to give you what I can legally. If there's something I can't divulge because of a privacy law, then I will, I, at least you have that answer, but we can, we can definitely look into that. And for lastly, Mr. Chairman, we had a bill floating around last year that talked, I uh, can't remember the exact language, but it talked about people who were who had to have a, a real residence in order to be registered. And I can't remember if that, if that got through the process. Or, you, know, you remember what I'm talking about? I don't remember, but I, you would run into federal law on that because homeless people are allowed to vote. And a lot of times, as a matter of fact, a lot of our churches, I'm, I'm really proud of the churches, also they go to church, they're homeless, especially right now with a lot of our uh, our uh, combat veterans are homeless, but they still want to vote. And they will register at a church saying, this is kind of my residence. They can receive mail there. They can receive their ballot there if it's an advanced mail ballot. And that's federal law. They have to be allowed a way to register to vote. I think also our military uh, men and women are allowed to, to use a box uh, if they're assigned overseas yeah, and we also, there's UACAVA, which gets into a whole other um, issue of how we it, provide ballots to soldiers overseas. And um, they having to, that has to do with the deadline that we send them a ballot and then they can provide that vote. They surrender the right to a secret ballot and then they electronically, through a secure network, give us that ballot back and we give it to the county. Well, I, I appreciate your responses to my questions. Could we ask the reviser to follow up on the last item to see? What happened to that legislation? Are you familiar with what I'm referring to? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank both you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, Representative Lee, and then one online. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a, some follow-ups to some questions that have already been asked. Um, going back to the drop box, can you tell me which statute actually allows for the use of drop boxes for ballots? There isn't a statute that bans or allows. They've been used for decades. Um, they've always been considered an extension of the clerk's office. Just like um, there's really not a statute that says you can use a post office box to drop a ballot in either. It's always been customary and customary and precedent to use it. So it's nothing new. It's just the conversation is more new. Okay. Um, <clears throat> that's very interesting, actually, that there's no statute then that would, that would uh, to dictate that. So based on last week's presentation, excuse me, in the Senate, um, there, this actually happened in Johnson County, uh, and a couple. You had already mentioned it. You talked about the cameras at ballot boxes. So, it was brought up that it was actually a cybersecurity issue, is what Johnson County was saying, because you said that it's not up to your office to be able to give that footage. Yeah, we don't own it. Right. So it's up to the county, and so they were being denied that access, um, which it was interesting because it was at a public library. Um, <clears throat> but that same individual also testified to this to this, that there were no ballot transfer forms from the drop boxes in Johnson County with the necessary four signatures, which I had actually never seen that form before. So uh, that was interesting because they did have that form as, um, as part of the hearing that day. 
what's being done about not having those four required signatures and why did that election get certified in the first place? Well, first off, they passed their audit, so everything zeroed out. So, and that's uh, it's up to the county. We don't certify local elections, so that would be a county question. In local elections, it goes to the county. The state board of canvassers doesn't certify. As it relates to why they give the video, again, that's the county owns it. We sure. have no authority over them any more than I have authority over your camera. Mm -hmm. um, as it relates to um, the four signatures, the statute says they have to take an oath. It doesn't say they have to have the four signatures. Okay. But we did tell the clerk just put the four signatures down there so folks know. But just because there's an, you know, one of the oldest statutes on elections is just because there's an administrative error doesn't mean the will of the people is overturned. And so just because there weren't four signatures, they still zero out. And it's basic accounting. You take the number of advanced mail ballots that were returned and you take the number of people that voted in person you get the aggregate and you marry that with the number of ballots and it zeroes out. If there's extra, if there's extra ballots, you have an administrative error. If there's less, then you're missing ballots and they all zero out because it's just math. So, so the chain of custody then, Mr. Chairman, for those four signatures, so we're, you basically just said, we don't, don't worry we about it. We didn't say anything. Again, we don't it's do the local. County. It is the county. Here. Okay, okay. Um, <clears throat> another question, if I might, Mr. Chair, uh, that was given to me, which I didn't, I, I, I had not heard of this before. What servers are transmitting the election res results to the Secretary of State's office? Uh, they gave me the acronym, acronym CIDL, and can you tell us if that data is presented in whole numbers or decimals like the Edison API sends to the media? It's neither. Um, what okay. we do is it is tabulated on our server in our office, and we wrote the software. And basically, they go through the back end from their county computer. They log into our system and input the number from their computer. Okay. And that populates the preliminary results. And that's on even your elections. Okay. Uh, one more question, if I might, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> um, with regard to citizenship and non-citizen voters, how exactly are we verifying this? Are you aware that our our Hobbs system has been seeing massive influx of registrations without a proper driver's license and that the last four digits of social security number references of unmatched identification by our HOV has been through the roof in Kansas since May 2nd, 2020, compared to the past several years. It would seem huge red flags like this be noticed by the Secretary of State because over a half a million don't match the info at all and 177,000 matched with deceased persons from ja dates January 2020 through September 11th, 2021. I don't think that's accurate. A couple okay. of things. I don't know what HOV is. Um, first off, a U.S. citizen would have to have a, a government-issued ID to vote. So even if that's advanced ba mail ballot, you have to have an ID to vote. vote. That's statute. So you would, how a non-U.S. citizen would get an advan a, a, a ID to be able to vote, you would have to be a citizen because it's against the law to issue an ID. Two, um, if there's a social security number, which they don't have a social security number, it'd be a duplicate. And so we'd know simply because, hey, this is somebody else's social security number and the county clerk would call and say, hey, you turn off all your Equifax and your credit reports because your ID has been stolen. As it relates to dead people, it's very difficult for them to stay on the rolls because what happens is when somebody dies, they have to report it to Social Security so Social Security funds are done. Then we get that data and we get it through vital statistics. Is that yearly? That happens yearly? Sometimes daily. When okay. somebody dies, we get notified. Once we get notified or the county's notified, they come off the system immediately. As a matter of fact, we tried as many ways. How does a dead person stay on the rolls? And the only way they can is if they died and you buried them in your backyard and didn't report it so you can keep getting the Social Security. Mm -hmm. Because outside of that, even our county clerks open the newspaper and, and, talk, and have relationships with their funeral homes that every time there's somebody died, they come right off the rolls. So it's very difficult for a dead person to remain on the rolls simply because we're getting that data from the feds, from the state, from the locals, from funeral homes, from newspapers. That's, that's the one that's very difficult to have dead people on the rolls. So last question, Mr. Chairman, and since you're running for office, I, I just want your opinion actually on this. Paper ballots, hand counting, and one vote, one day. 
How do you feel about that? Just That's a policy issue with you guys. Um, I, it's it's going to be difficult because you're going to reduce voter turnout. We're not real big on changing the way people vote. I mean, advanced in-person voting has been very popular across the state. I think you'll get a lot of pushback if they say, I can't vote early. Do you think that leads gone? to a lot of fraud, having all of like people being able to vote for a month? I don't think there's fraud. I think if you're going to have a concern about Verlian, because what's the difference between me voting Monday before the ele or the Friday before the election day and on election day? It's the same system. I mean, there's not more nefarious on Friday than it is on Tuesday. I think where the conversation on advanced early voting is going to change is someday you're going to have a candidate that's going to be charged with murder the day three days before election. And the election was pretty much already done. That's not fraud. That's just voting before the election was over. And that's a policy discussion for you all to have. But I know overwhelmingly a third of the voting population voted before election day in Kansas. And I don't think you're going to change them wanting that. But if that's a policy decision for you, you guys are the policymakers. We execute. We just listen to the people, which the people in my district are, I think they're just tired of feeling that at the core of our republic is secure elections. And they don't feel like they've had secure elections, certainly not every county, and certainly, um, certainly not every county. But there has been data that I have seen in Johnson County, in Sedgwick County, and even in some of these small rural counties, you know, that, that uh, not that our clerks aren't doing their job or those offices aren't doing their job, but that, I mean, you talked about the poll books uh, a little bit ago and the hosting of those poll books. You know, I had a, a gal send me in my district, send me a snapshot of, she was working the poll that day, and um, an internet connection had popped up, and she took a picture, a screenshot of it saying, hey, here's another basically server, you know, that we could access if we wanted to. And I just think that from a confidence standpoint, whether there was fraud or whether there wasn't fraud, um, I just was curious, you know, people are starting to want to vote like the Amish. We want to vote one day, <laughs> we want to hand count, and we want to vote with a paper ballot. And I was right. just curious to know what your opinion was. So w every county in this election will have paper verification. I kind of want all three, and I'll get to that here in a second. Um, but that's why we want the poll book reg um, regulation bill passed, so that we can make sure it's not pinging that network. Because, again, like I said earlier, that's my concern, is if you can find it, you can hack it. So and that's right now you say that's the bill ESS. we're introducing n the server who who is well, that server that we're using book, right now the those? server is through ESNS but we own the data and we populate with various poll books because each county can contract with whoever e poll book they want to contract with but we don't regulate we have no regulatory authority that's what we're asking for to add, to ease those concerns mm -hmm. I will say this representative you do have a great opportunity when these people are concerned and I said this to a lot of folks ask them to be a poll worker if they're concerned, then you go be the eyes in that. And we were telling legislators this during the 2021 election, your name's not on the ballot. Go be a poll worker and witness this. Mm -hmm. Let's see what they do and how they volunteer. It's a great opportunity. And also share with those representatives. You know, we did over 300 post audit elections, and every one of them passed. And that's mathematics. You know, Ohio brags it because they do risk limiting audits. that they, Their elections pass at 99.1%. My concern is, what about the point eight? We zeroed out perfect 100% over 300 times. We did it. That's a great opportunity to sell your state. We do it right in Kansas. We have voter ID. Mm -hmm. It is hard to commit a felony while you're showing someone your ID. I know yet to see somebody rob a bank, say, here's my ID, and I'll put the money in the bag. It's the same thing when you vote. And you can't vote twice because you'd have to have two, person, two identities. And that's where it gets me. And then it, to have that actually sway election, you'd have to have thousands of people with two identities. That's why Kansas really does get it right. It's fa fascinating to me, whereas there was a big push against voter ID, my Democrat colleagues across the country now as secretaries of state are saying, how do you do voter ID for mail ballots again? Because they do signature verification, which we do too, but we also do voter ID, which is more secure than the... So now I got Democrat secretaries of state asking how we do voter ID. That's why Kansas is leading. I am so thankful that we do voter ID. And here's my last comments, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. So my last comments would be, I don't think that's where the fraud comes in is the actual voter ID. I think where the fraud is coming in from the, from the, the research that I have done. And one of the folks that I listened to last week was Dr. Fr um, 
was Dr. Uh, Douglas Frank, and he does a lot with Mike Lindell. And I thought, you know, is that just hype? Is this just the My Pillow guy, right? Spending a millions of dollars on a cause. But it's interesting because I had the conversation with him, and it happens. When, it doesn't. It doesn't happen in our in our little county clerk's offices. Our and our poll workers are great. I mean, our district, they're great and they're secure and they're watching what's going on. It is happening. It's happening through. I think it's happening through Elvis. And so you know that they're they're hacking in. They're putting a bunch of votes in that system. And then they count those votes, and then they hack back in. They take those votes out, which is why our numbers are off. Let me reassure you on that, then, because our numbers aren't off. They passed their audit. All this doesn't count votes. It's just data. Right, names, right? It's just names. So let's say I did populate it with fake people. They can't vote because they don't have an ID. So that's why the number zeroed out perfectly. And I want to be clear. Dr. Frank's, Frank did not accuse any fraud in Kansas last week. He said where there's smoke and there's fire, but there was no smoke because we did over 300 post-election audits. If there was smoke, it would have showed up in the audit. And that's a hand count on paper audit. So he's coming in here explaining, but he's not a Kansas election uh, expert. He's a mathematician, but it doesn't add up. Even his accusation saying too many people voted in the 2000 election, which I'm like, no, unless there's 100% people voting, it's not too much. But it's on track with where we've been. And I know some folks are surprised that, you know, a Democrat nominee won Johnson County. I've lived in Johnson County for 25 years. This has been coming for a long time. I remember when I lived out in Hayes, Bill Graves was running for governor, and there has not been a Republican nominee win Ellis County for 40 years till Bill Graves did. Population shift, voting trend shift, Western Wyandotte County. I mean, Tom Burroughs, if he chooses not to run again, that district could go Republican because population shift is economy shift. And Johnson County is becoming very Democrat for years. When I was first elected in 2000, there was one Democrat elected in Johnson County. What is there now, eight? It's, it's a battleground county. It's what happens. Missouri used to be a battleground state. Now it's not. It's not fraud. It's just dynamics of population, political thoughts, political theories, the marketplace of ideas changes the way people think and the way they consume their information through social media changes voting practices. I really appreciate it. I do time. want to catch uh, three more that are waiting. So uh, I, no, I'm, okay. I'm just thanking him. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Representative. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. And um, I believe uh, Representative Neighbor online. Unmute yourself. No, no, I don't have my hand raised. Okay, okay. Thank you. Is there someone else online? Okay. Uh, next would be uh, Representative Topker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll try to make these quick. Uh, the Secretary, uh, we were talking about this poll books earlier. Is a voter who shows up at the wrong precinct made to sign the poll book so that they can vote provisional? Yes. Okay. And they have to show their ID. And just so you know how that works is that becomes so, a provisional ballot. Anything that would be on that person's true ballot still counts. So if they're voting for president, you're right. voting, in, unless you're voting outside the county, that would still count because it would count if you vote in the right place. Right. But if it goes down to precinct committee person, that one's next. I was just wondering if that's how sometimes poll books get inflated by at all? Do they get inflated sometimes? I no, um, it all zeroes out after they do the, before they do the canvas. They, they, they'll go before the county board of can canvassers, say, here's our provisionals, here's why they are. There's a lot of ballots that will not even go to the board of can canvassers by statute. So for example, okay. if you refuse to show your ID, you'll get a provisional ballot, but it will never count until you show your ID. Okay, so there are uh, reports that there are more votes than voters in some place. Yeah, that was Judicial Watch, and I'm a little bit frustrated with that because they said 105% of the registered voters voted in Johnson County. It was actually 75. Um, what they based it on was 2010 census data and then made a run rate for 2005, or 2015 and then said, oh, therefore in 2020 there was too many, but except for it wasn't a straight line population growth in Johnson County, it was a massive view. 
with the, you guys are in the middle of redistricting. If you're looking at Johnson County, it's picking up seats because the population in Johnson County has absolutely exploded. And so using 2010 census data, and again, it, you can't use census census data okay. because it has non-U.S. citizens and minors. Okay. And that's where they get the number. And if you notice when they did that, there's also a return envelope where you can write a check and send them money. And so have you checked into why some voters went to vote and were told that they had already voted? On, they went to vote on election day and were told you, you've already voted. And uh, is this an advanced voting problem that someone is voting for them through advanced voting and then when they go on election day, they're told that they already voted? No, and what it is, and they I'd like to kind of see who said that, because normally they're not told they already voted. They said they already received a ballot. So then they're given a provisional. And so that does happen. And we have a lot of folks that apply for a ballot in July. Come November, they forgot. So it's kind of that it's on them that they It's they on forgot. them. And this is where we go back to your ballot is your responsibility. But what happens is they get a provisional and they vote. If the mail ballot never came in, the provisional counts. If they got the mail ballot, it counts, and the provisional is discarded. Thank you very much. And that's how they're able to zero out between the poll book, the applications, and the number of ballots cast. I believe we'll finish off with Representative Proctor and Representative Miller. In Thank that you, order. Mr. Chair. Um, I, I, share the, I share the conviction of several of the people who've already asked questions that the most important, the core fundamentals of our democracy is confidence in the vote, that the vote reflects the will of people. And I believe the, the biggest threat to that, to the, the election integrity, is this pending uh, federal takeover of elections because, uh, you know, the Congress has uh, decided that they know better than the framers of the Constitution and uh, that the state shouldn't have the right to run their own elections. So um, you talked about uh, uh, sec uh, the coordination that you do with those secretaries of state. Could you talk about what you've done to uh, make it clear to not just our federal de delegation, but to the Congress that uh, we run our elections just fine? Yeah, we've. I was disappointed my Congresswoman woman wouldn't return my phone calls. Everybody else did. Um, in our concern, like there's a lot of stuff in HR1, um, and it doesn't look like it's going to pass, but some of it we logistically cannot do. It requires early advanced voting three weeks prior to the election. Well, that's fine for Johnson County and Sedgwick and Shawnee, but when you get out to Wallace County, that county can't afford that much rent and poll workers when there's not even going to be a voter come in two weeks early. You know, that's where it gets to be a problem is you, which you, we can already, we can do it in the big counties. We just can't do some of HR1 in the rural counties. I mean, it's just, it is not feasible to do it. And what happens the way when federal government, the federal government gives dollars to the elections, it's one-time money. And that's why they said, like, well, how come you're not spending your money? Because I may never get any money from you again. And not that I want it, but we, we, well, you give me a mandate, but then it's never funded. And it's the mandate's not on me, it's on our counties. I'm just the one who gets sued. And so that was our pushback on HR1. And to be honest with you, we have visited with members of Congress that share those same concerns. It's just there's so many voices in the room and the conversation from both the left and the right on elections has gotten so crazy, they can't have a legitimate, honest conversation like they did when the Help America Vote Act passed. When the Help America Vote Act passed, they realized there was issues after Bush v. Gore and they wanted some basic standards, but they wanted locals involved. So they created the EAC. And so I have two appointments on it. I appointed myself and then I, I have to appoint a Democrat and one of the more knowledgeable ones, although I disagree with him on policy, I do agree with his knowledge because he's very smart, is our um, Douglas County Clerk, Jamie Shue. He has been, he has a wealth of knowledge on elections and he does care about election security and he serves with me on the EAC. Well, H, HR1 takes us out of that conversation. And that's what terrifies me because I need somebody like Jamie, I need somebody like me or Brian Kasky having that voice in the room so they understand the Kansas way of elections versus the LA County way of elections. We'll have Representative Miller and Representative Howell, but before I put that, I, I just want to tell the committee I appreciate your civil conversation for the past hour. Thank you very much. Keep up the good work, Representative Miller. <laughs> well, what you're going to say, you can't say now. <laughs> that was that was a subtle warning to me. Um, well, first of all, uh, about the uh, person with an ID never committing a felony. Uh, I once represented an arsonist who burned down the country club in Representative Garber's district and. 
he had a pretty strong case because he left his ID on the sidewalk as he was leaving the scene of the crime. True story. Um, even I couldn't get him off. You mind if I use it? <laughs> it's, it's public knowledge. Um, and I, we have time, Mr. Chairman, and this testimony is invaluable. To have you here bursting these stories, these myths about what goes on in elections is fantastic because, well, you know me, I've had, I've represented people on election contests since 1990 and I've never ever, even though we find mistakes because they're run by humans, never once have I had a shred of doubt that they were full rife with integrity. Uh, and I've represented people that thousands of votes that ended up in ties and it, your suggestion of serving as a poll worker is good, although most people in this room couldn't handle it. It's too tough of a day. It's high stress. But if we could, Mr. Chairman, I mentioned the, the hearing on Friday, and I'm, I'm afraid that we won't have this kind of time on Friday to have you give a, an adequate answer. Could you explain what you mean when you say that you audited something? Yeah. The one, two, threes of an audit, so people can understand the the guarantee that goes with the results. Right, and this also goes back to Representative Lee's comment with machines as opposed to just paper. Um, in days where, where security is a risk, um, I like having paper because you can't hack a sheet of paper, but you can burn it. You can blow it up. Um, our concerns during recounts after 2020 elections was terrorist attacks because there was starting to be ch chatter. And the last thing I want is somebody throwing a grenade in a tabulation room and blowing up all the ballots. Well, now what do I do? Well, now I have an image copy of that ballot. So the election is still secure. And then we have the ones and zeros copy, which is what we put on our website. So you have some preliminary results, but that's not actually what's certified. That just gives you a reflection of how the election's going that night. Then what happens is we pick a race, they pick a precinct, and they do a hand count. And again, it's three people from the community of two different parties, and they're not poll workers. And so they're people that are supposed to be of upstanding character in the community. That's subjective, I get it, but that's what's in the statute. And then what they do is they'll pull out the ballots for that precinct that the tabulator counted, and they will hand count it, and all three people have to agree that ballot says what it says. If you remember Bush v. Gore, it always cracked me up because the, I can use my glasses for this. I love imitating this guy. I've been in, imitating this guy since the 90s. He'd pull out the ballot, look at it, hand it down, pull out the ballot, look at him. Just take your glasses off. Um, <laughs> But um, that's literally what they were doing is they were looking at hanging chads and dimple chads and all three of them were having to agree what was the intent of that vote voter and what was the ballot. That's what we do. The difference is, is we don't have chads and punch cards anymore. It's actually printed off on a piece of paper in a font that's easily read. And that's why it's so much easier to zero these ballots out because the subjectivity is just completely taken out. Was that satisfactory? I hope it was. Satisfied, sir? No. Okay. <laughs> Are you that's done? If that's, his answer, if that's his answer, that's his answer. All right. Thank you, sir. And Representative Howe, and anyone else who also has a question? Thank you, Chair. Um, I just have one question and a, and a small comment, and then my, the rest of my questions are really more directly related to HB 2046, and we haven't really started the official hearing on that, so I can hold those and if that, if you'd rather, that I'm happy to do that. Um, my just one comment: I don't know about any other committee members here. I would love to know, which obviously no one has to answer me. I'm not actually asking, but I have worked as a poll worker and as a supervising judge many times. In fact, I come from a multi generational family that has served in this way. My mother served under four different. Uh, Cedric County election commissioners uh, in her lifetime before she decided to retire in recent years from doing that. Um, but, um, 
and I did that before my husband was on the ballot, and we thought it might not look good. So I would just like to go a step further than the Secretary of State, and I would like to urge each and every one of you committee members to serve as a poll worker or a supervising judge, perhaps on an election where you're not on the ballot. But um, if you can handle the House floor on some of these marathon days, I have faith that you can handle the five <laughs> five in the morning till about eight, nine o'clock at night day. But at least in Cedric County, you, you are allowed to have an option of a half day. But um, I think it would be very eye-opening to everyone. And in my opinion, everybody should do it at least once. But um, OK, done commenting. But my one question for Thank you. you. Real quick, like, <laughs> Thank you for being a poll worker. Um, and every time I go speak publicly, I say, hey, do we have any poll workers here? And they raise their hands, and I thank them. Really, we have the quality of elections we have, not just because voter ID and good policy, because people are working the polls. And so thank you for doing that. I always want to be intentional. It is very important. You can thank my mama. Um, thank the, you. <laughs> um, my question for, for you for right now is, uh, can you tell us how long have we had ballot boxes specifically in Kansas? It feels like they're newer to me, but I maybe maybe we just didn't have them in Central County. We've had them in Johnson County for over 20 years. Really? Um, I okay. can't remember how if Sedgwick did or not. A lot of counties have had them for years simply because, you know, if you think about, you know, we have four county election clerks. We have 105 county clerks that also are election clerks. And so a lot of these other counties, I mean, they're in a corner office and they're not only handling the election administration, they're also handling all the county business. And so for people to come in and bring in their advanced mail ballot early to the clerk, they don't have the resources to staff that all the time, or sometimes they're bringing in part-time people. So they've had drop boxes out front. And they've, you know, a lot of the security provisions that we were suggesting because we didn't have authority were basically the county clerks like, here's how we do it, because these county clerks don't want to get sued. You know, they, they don't want their integrity called into question, and I understand that. And it's a very motivating factor. And so um, they've been around for decades. It's just with COVID, and we were losing clerks. I mean, some of our clerks, they were in quarantine trying to pull off an election. That's, that's a challenge. And... Um, Drop boxes allowed them to secure the ballot without putting it in the post office where I'm going to tell you, talk to any of our clerks they are concerned about the U.S. post office. I mean, everybody was last year. Everybody was concerned with the post office. And so this was an avenue for them to receive ballots in a secure way that Kansans were handling the ballot and it never left the state, let alone the county. And a lot of times, most of our counties, if you go to, you can either go to the post office or across the street to the clerk's office. They're, they're, on the, they're right across the street from each other. So why not just drop it in that box instead of that box? Well, thank you, Mr. Secretary, for sure, being thank here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, is there any other questions? I have another question. Just one, one more, and uh, then we'll turn to this. I, I just wanted to comment about, we had talked, uh, I brought up the uh, HAVV, H-A-V-V, and I wanted to let you know what that, that acronym stood for, because I didn't know either. Uh, it's Help America Vote Verification, and it's actually run through the Social Security Administration. Um, so anyway, um, curious to know, about the data, how long will we be keeping that data from 2020, from that election? Kept for four years? 22, 22 months. months. But the voter date is there in per perpetuity. Okay. Um, after the Help America Vote Act, and they centralized the voting registration, which is a public record, we've got it going back to that. I can okay. go back and I, I can go back and look at you know which elections I, I, I voted in going back to the ninety or the two thousands. Okay, and then just um, just because you were talking about those drop boxes again, I I'm, you're not nervous at all about people dumping ballots into those boxes since they're not, not going to dump them there they're going to dump them in the post office because there's less security in the post office than there is at the drop box the drop box can be locked so that nobody can put one in seven o'clock they can put a lock on it you can't even open it well they can but do they i mean i don't know the well rule. if you give us the authority to regulate it we can say that okay um, most of them do because they don't want kid, high school kids throwing firecrackers in it at two o'clock in the morning um it, but at the post office box that thing's never locked. They can th if, if I'm going to do ballot harvesting and throw away Republican ballots and keep Democrat ballots or vice versa, I'm not putting that in the county drop box. I'm putting that in the post office box because nobody knows, and I could do it at 3 o'clock in the morning. So 
this is this is new to me. I'm not I'm not a veteran uh, election worker. So, would you support legislation then? Because I didn't realize that drop boxes were not in statute, but I I feel like it should be in statute, and I'm for transparency and making sure we keep them as safe as possible. Would you be supportive of putting some sort of legislation together that drop boxes are in statute and they're secure somehow with cameras or something yeah. so there's oversight to them? That, that was the answer to the first question <clears throat> Representative Proctor said is, yeah, if you're going to do something, give us the authority to regulate so we can hold everybody accountable. And that increases the, the um, trust in it because now every county does it the same way. And the county clerks actually like the consistency from Atchison County all the way down to Morton County because if they all do it the way we tell them to, nobody gets sued because they did it the way we told them to do it. Lock and mid Yes, yeah. So we just need the authority to do it. Great, thanks. And we just have one more question. Sure. Uh, Representative Topaker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, I know that the county clerks don't take orders from you but because they're elected in their own right. But you appoint the election commissioners and so... Uh, how much authority over them do you have after you make the appointment? Can you tell them, can you give them orders on what you want, like on policy? Not necessarily policy because they're not policy makers, but on practices. And, you know, we've got three out of the four new. And so a lot of the things like errors, it's just training, ongoing training. Not necessarily rules and regs, it's just training. Hey, it's, it's sort of like an employee in your office, except for, you know, they, they have to obey county policy as well. So, for example, they can't, they can't spend money. The county can tell them what they're going to get paid, how much they're going to get paid, how much their staff is going to get paid, whether or not they can hire a new person, anything like that. The county decides what equipment they're going to buy. But we, but we, we come in and say, hey, if you're going to do this, and make sure you're doing this over here to make sure it's secure. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Congratulations on your escalation to chair. Oh, thank you. Thanks. I'm glad I finally got to show up after a couple of weeks. So. <laughs> yeah. It hit me twice, too. Yeah. And I was vaxxed. So. Uh, I want to give you just one announcement uh, for the, uh, our next meeting Thursday, and that is for the hearing for HB 2486 and HB 2555, which will include uh, probably some testimony from the same uh, secretary and staff that we've had visiting today and maybe others. Um, make sure if you have uh, testimony to get it turned in, uh, emailed in PDF format uh, to the committee assistant by 3.30 Wednesday, February the 9th. That's tomorrow night, tomorrow afternoon. So um, if there's nothing else for the committee, uh, this committee is adjourned.